Hey everyone, welcome to Fighting Over the Card Catalog, a snarky look back on young adult novels of the 80s and 90s. I'm Jess. I'm Steven, and I'm here to make my wife happy. We're taking a journey to find out how many terrible and hopefully some not so terrible books from my youth I can get my husband to read before he reconsiders this whole marriage. Mm hmm. How's the pandemic going for you? It has been a very weird week, not only with the pandemic, but with my mom. Yeah, it's been a so week. So in the middle of this pandemic, I get a call at midnight, Saturday night, Sunday morning. It was Saturday, yeah. Yeah, saying that my mom's in the emergency room. And the only reason any of us knew this is because <clears throat> my aunt called. So. My mom had her phone, and being a, I don't know, not a tech savant, what's the opposite of that? A Luddite? <laughs> anyway, she had no idea how to even find somebody's number in her cell phone. I didn't know this bit. And so the only reason that she got a hold of somebody is because my aunt had accidentally called her cell phone earlier in the day. And my mom somehow stumbled upon the recent call list and saw Becky's name and Oy. called her to tell her she was in the emergency room. Wow. And, yeah, anyway, she's not doing too well with her leg. No, but she is out of the hospital now for a bit. Yeah. And hopefully didn't catch the COVID-19 while she was in there. Hopefully. Hopefully. And hopefully they still do surgery on her next week like they were supposed to. If the hospitals don't get overrun. And we tried to get them to move it up, the surgery on her leg, to actually try to help save her leg. Mm -hmm. And we couldn't, her doctor never even came in to see her. His partner came in. Like after she'd been in the hospital a couple of days mm -hmm. and said, we might move it up. It might be at the end of the week. Maybe it'll be next week. We don't know. So we still don't know what's going on with that. Anyway, I hate healthcare in America. Yeah, me too. Um, and then we've got, you know, uh, stuff going on. Like, you know, I, I had to go into work Monday because we, we, you tried not to. Yeah, my company actually sent out a policy over the weekend saying if you can work from home, work from home. So I tried to work from home. I've worked from home before on Fridays. I work from home. But, but so many people were working from home. I actually could not get into the server. Yeah, you couldn't even log on. I couldn't even log on. So it was like, fuck. I ended up having to go into work. And then that day they started saying, Okay, well, here's other ways you can log into our VPN. Um, and so far, that's worked. The last two days, that's worked. But then I find out there was a guy at work on Monday who has a presumptive case of COVID. Yay. And, you know, the thing is, he was on the other side of the building. A, a, and it's a very large campus. A, a place, you know, it's... I. I normally take my walks. I would I would have walked on the second floor above where he would have been eating his lunch. Mm -hmm. um, so as on Monday when he started showing symptoms, I was there and, you know, wouldn't have had any contact with him, but have no idea. Yeah, the week who prior. Who else he came in contact oh. with when he was. Yeah. When he was, yeah. There on Monday. But I think it's the week prior before yeah. he even started showing symptoms that would, you right. know, he could have been anywhere. Yeah. So. And in contact with anybody who could have yeah. been anywhere. So that's a little upsetting yeah. to know, but. We've got 10 confirmed cases now in our county. Uh, one person died, but not because of it, because of underlying health conditions. And then they found out he had. COVID-19 after he died. So, eh? Eh? Anyway. Could have been a factor. Could have been a factor. We don't know. Anyways, I'm pretty worried about it. Because with my MS, I'm immunocompromised. And then with the drug I'm taking, 
um, to stop it from progressing, I'm immunosuppressed. So it's like, yeah. So basically, come at me. Not ba- really. I'm just kidding. Yeah. <laughs> Basically, you have chemo twice a year to wipe out your immune system to keep uh-huh. it from attacking your uh-huh. own body. Uh-huh. My so, already yeah. uh, compromised immune system. Right. Yeah. So, I'm basically self-isolating. I may not l- leave the house for another 18 months. We'll see. But as there's nothing to do, anyway, it's fine. <laughs> You know, I mean, this past weekend, when everybody was really, you know, having their first taste of it, everybody's freaking out. Like, oh, my God, I'm so bored. And uh, and I'm just looking at people like, do you really never just spend an entire weekend at home and not go out? <laughs> yeah, I think there are people that are. That yeah. blows my mind. Like this week, I can see people getting weird. You know, with kids home from school and Mm -hmm. people working from home. But, yeah, over the weekend, I was like, Hmm. I love not going anywhere on a weekend. (laughs) But that's just me. So, anyway. Hey, everybody, stay home if you can. Stay the fuck home. So you don't kill people like me. Thank you. So, this week. We read the first in the Angels Trilogy by Lurleen McDaniel, Angels Watching Over Me, published in 1996. Tell us about it. Happy holidays! Bah humbug! Happy is not the way Lee or Leah? Leah. Leah Lewis Hall would describe herself at the moment. She's spending the 12 days of Christmas in an Indianapolis hospital while her mother is thousands of miles away on a honeymoon with husband number five. Leah went to the doctor with nothing more than a broken finger, but he ordered her to undergo some tests. Now she's stuck in the hospital alone. Then Leah meets her hospital roommate, a young Amish girl named Rebecca, and her big family. Cynical 16-year-old Leah has never known people like this before. From Rebecca's handsome brother Ethan, who can barely look Leah in the eye, to her kind older sister Charity, the Amish family captivates Leah with its simple loving ways. When Leah receives frightening information about her condition, her new friends show her that miracles can happen and that sometimes angels appear in the most unexpected places. So, on a scale from one being the best book ever to the Dementor's Kiss of Ten, sucking the soul out of your love of reading, what do you give it? Well, first of all, to quote a a great singer, a fuck you, fuck you very, very much. (laughs) I give this book a nine. Yeah. I I felt like (laughs) I was reading an episode of Highway to Heaven. That's what the name of the show was. With, without Michael Landon involved. Oh, well, he was a dick, so. <laughs> so anyway, yeah. I think you did this specifically so I would rant during, yep. <laughs> during our conversation. Partially. And also because it's like when the only Lurleen books, there was a ebook, I mean, an audio book for at the library. Mm. So. It had to do with that, but also, yeah, I told you you were going to hate it. Yeah. It's a solid eight for me. So. <laughs> um, so I know we've mentioned it way back before, but let's just go ahead and state as we go into this that we're both agnostic at best. Um, so the uh, religious parts of this is what did not set well with us. <laughs> right? Yes, I would say for the most part, as well as the saccharine writing. Oh, well, yeah, but that's just Lord Lane. Mm. Okay. Yeah. Fuck you, Laura Lane. <laughs> <laughs> so, <sighs> Leah basically has the worst mom we've come across yet. Leah has a broken finger, which has landed her in the hospital. Okay, so I would not say that she was worse than the mom who was trying to get her 
one daughter to be smart and the other one to be good looking. Oh, yeah, that was pretty terrible. Um, Because she did just have a broken finger and she's on a honeymoon with a guy she seems to really like. Unlike some of her other marriages. But the way she talks to her is so shitty. Yeah, I mean... She's, know, like, not worried about her at all. Right. Because all she knows is she has a broken finger. I'd worry if my child had a broken finger was in the hospital all by herself. Yeah. Well, I mean, I would worry. I don't know that I'd cut my overseas trip short. No, but you'd at least talk to your child a little bit nicer. And, like, have some sense of sympathy and comfort to how you spoke to them, right? Yeah. Okay. Anyway, her mom's, yeah, on her honeymoon in Japan. And she's all, your toes fine. You don't need us to come back. And then she talks about, you know, just shopping and how, what is it? How Neil absolutely spoils her and it's gross and I don't like her. Uh, and yeah, it's also like a week before Christmas, so that's real fun. But to be fair, Leah's not exactly a little ray of sunshine either. She's pretty sulky about having to move from Dallas to Indianapolis, uh, where her new stepfather is fixing up a big farmhouse. Um, she's on the pediatric ward, which... Uh, sounds horrifying. Did you pick up on this? Farther down the hall, another door was painted to look like the open mouth of a rabbit. <laughs> it read baby ward. I'm trying to picture that. I mean, is it just like, <laughs> you know, like straight on into a big dark hole yeah, into a that's rabbit? That's weird. Yeah. Anyways, that's horrifying. I wouldn't want to put my baby in there. Thank you. <laughs> Uh, the rest of the war doesn't sound as bad, at least. Um, when she gets back to her room, she's got a little roommate. There's a five-year-old crying and uh, clinging to a woman. And we get an Amish fashion alert. Her dark blue skirt brushed the floor. The sleeves of her blouse, blouse were long, the neck high. A filmy white cap covered the woman's long hair which was twisted into a bun at the nape of her neck. She wore no makeup and no jewelry, and she had no wedding band. Fun! Hmm. So the little girl's crying because her parents have to go home to nurse the baby. Her brother and sister are going to come tomorrow, but, like, damn, she's five. Yeah. She's, like, barely been around electricity, and you're just leaving her in a hospital. Yeah, so my initial thought is, why did they leave the baby at home anyway? <laughs> You've got yeah, a right? baby. You take the baby with the parents, you don't? Right. <laughs> I don't know, anyway. Yeah, no, you're totally right. Um, the parents introduce themselves as Jacob and Tilly Longacre, and the little girl is Rebecca. Then they just get out of there, leaving with Remember what I've told you. The Lord's angel will watch over you until we can be with you. At that point, were you just like, oh, God, we're fucking in for it? <laughs> uh, Rebecca asks Leah if she's an angel, and she's like, uh, no. But Leah decides she basically has to take care of this little Amish girl. Uh, she got a spider bite and has to have an IV. Which is scary, but Leah talks her through it. And then Rebecca asks her to tell her the story about Mary Jane and the angel. And Leah's like, uh, because Leah is not religious at all. Um, but Rebecca has a little Bible storybook. Um, and Leah's like, you know, she always thought the whole virgin birth bit was bullshit. And you, can't you know, have a baby and remain a virgin. I mean, um, and after they're woken up by nurses taking vitals that night, Rebecca asks her to tell her the story of Abraham and Isaac. I wouldn't be able to do that one either, Leah. Isn't, isn't that the one where, man, that it was. <laughs> anyway, it was the one where, uh, Abraham got drunk. Oh, is it that? I mean, yeah. that may not be the story, but I think Abraham and Isaac are part of that st of this and, story. Okay, wait, what happened? Something bad. 
it it's like <laughs> okay, so the Bible is weird in ways that sometimes it intimates stuff. Right. It intimates that he that Isaac came in and saw his dad naked. Yes. And then did something oh. that the Bible doesn't say. And then his father woke up and the next day and punished him for it. And how did you interpret that as a young Baptist lad? Um, <laughs> I guess first we should figure out if that's the story that we're talking about. But yeah, I fig- I I took it as, well, you're not supposed to be gay and you're not supposed to have incest. Okay, well, one of those is good. <laughs> Okay. Yeah. I mean, you know, is that what you thought happened? Like Isaac but had like, sex with his dad it, it, or Yeah, that he did something to where he was looking at his father naked even uh-huh. if he didn't touch him, but but probably, I mean it just intimates it. Uh-huh. But then Isaac is I mean, and this this story has caused a lot of war. Oh. Because, because there is one religion in the world that says they came from Isaac and another one that says they came from uh, Abraham. Oh. And Isaac was actually the older brother, but he got punished and everything got given to Abraham. And so therefore the Jews believe that Wait. they are the God's chosen children because he was, is that right? Anyway. This this is this might be all convoluted. Was Abraham not the dad? Um, Hi, welcome to Theology Talk with Jess and Steve. <laughs> yeah, so like as I'm telling stories, I'm like, is that right? I mean, I gotta know now. This is a story little Rebecca is asking for. So that's that was my thought. What is the story of Abraham and Isaac? Oh, God commands Abraham to offer his son Isaac okay. as a sacrifice. So, not the particular story. <laughs> Still not very fun, though, to talk with a five-year-old about, but, but probably not dirty either. Probably. Just Google naked dad huh. Bible. So, I think it was... E- Ishmael, that was the older son. Oh, okay, so here's here's that. When he drank some of his wine, he became drunk and lay uncovered inside his tent. This is Abraham. I don't know who this is. Okay. But this is the story. Ham, the father of, father of Canaan, saw his father naked. Oh, okay, And told his that. two brothers outside. But Shem and Japheth took a garment and laid it across their shoulders. Then they walked in backwards and covered their father's naked body. Their faces were turned the other way so they would not see their father naked. When Noah awoke from his wine and found out that his youngest son, what his youngest son had done to him, he said, Curseth be Canaan, the lowest of slaves will will he be to his brothers. Right, because... I've heard it, this is just from a book, that the tribes of Ham were the Africans. Maybe that's it. Maybe. Yeah. Anyway. See, I just, because like I have heard that, I just took it as, you know, like he was told his brothers that dad was in there drunk and naked. Okay. So here's my, I guess the, here's where my issue with that came in. Okay. You make your son a slave and tell him that he is the lowest of all men. <laughs> Because he saw you naked and told yeah, your brothers. Because it's disrespectful as hell. There's got to be something else going on in between there. Okay. Okay. You just have a dirty mind. I'm like me, I'm just here for respect. <laughs> you walk in, you accidentally see one of your parents oh naked. Uh oh, you're a slave now. It's, no, there's got to be something else going it's on. It's Bible in times. There. Shit was rough. <laughs> So anyway, uh, Leah is <laughs> Leah is aghast to learn that Rebecca has never heard of Snow White or Cinderella. She thought all kids 
had seen the Disney movies. It's like, she says she knows of the Amish. Like, she doesn't know about them, but she knows they're there. And it's like, you don't know she wouldn't have seen a movie? Come on. Anyways, but then she's like, she doesn't even tell her the story. You could at least do that. But anyway, she uh, talks about stereotypical cowboys and Indian type Texas stories. Later, she's woken up by another nurse who just goes to Rebecca and tucks her in and stands over her. Leah feels peaceful and falls asleep. I would have been creeped out, but do you, Leah? She sees her doctors the next morning and they want to take CT scans. She had a hole in her pinky bone that caused the break. So she tells them her knee and her back hurt too and they poke at them a bit. Rebecca seems worse and upset so Leah goes to press the call button when suddenly a male hand clamped over hers and a strong firm voice boomed. What are you doing to our sister? Oh, but it's just Rebecca's brother, Ethan, and he's super hot, so it's, like, super fine. Their sister, Charity, is there, too. And she and Leah start talking about Amish life, about their farm and animals, and the seven kids in the family, and the huge breakfast they have every day. Uh, But then Leah can't believe Charity's done with school at 15. But she's learned everything the bishop thinks she needs to be a good wife and mother. Leah is shocked. Shocked, I tell you. Which ends up pissing Ethan off and they get, like, into a tip. Which upsets Rebecca, so they apologize and it's fine. The cool nurse Molly arrives to take Leah to get her scan. And she tells her how weird those kids are and she's like, Molly's like, girl, calm your tits. They're different. Not weird. And schools are a bit about Amish ways. And she's just glad they accept modern medicine. And it's like, yeah, me too. Mm -hmm. But then she decides to break HIPAA laws and tells her all about Rebecca. She's saying she's a very sick little girl. It's a brown recluse that bit her. And now she has a strep or staph infection. And she's on powerful IV antibiotics. Yeah, I don't know when this book it, Molly. was written, but it was probably before HIPAA loss. I mean, that really became a big thing with the... I actually feel like we've had this discussion uh, before. With the um, it, advent of on, 1996. Oh. Okay, but still you shouldn't be telling yeah. another patient about another patient. Anyways. Right. <laughs> Damn it, Molly. Anyways. Uh, afterwards, Leah and Charity have another chat, and they both kind of get a bit offended about the other's views on, like, divorce and shit. Because Leah's mom is on her fifth marriage. Um, and Charity's blown away that Leah's not into religion. And Leah's blown away that the Amish don't have phones. <sighs> she knows nothing. Uh, Leah's mom calls, and after talking with the doctors, who can only say she is manifesting symptoms that are consistent with any number of health problems. Like, cool, y'all. That's real helpful. And then more of her mom going, but until I get some sort of definitive word from your doctor... I'm not cutting my honeymoon short. That seemed okay with you the last time we talked. Mm. (sighs) Leah goes to get food and runs into Ethan at the vending machines. And he doesn't have any money and has never had candy. So she buys him a Milky Way. And then she gets hella pissy because he's not talking and looking at her. And finally she's all, what is it? Don't you, do you dislike me? dislike you she looked as if he looked as if she'd slapped him i do not dislike you leah lewis hall i think that you are the most beautiful girl i have ever set my eyes upon because of course (sighs) he says he's only taken martha dewberry for a buggy ride before you know what i mean (laughs) hot 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 uh 
she thinks he's feeding her a line, which he doesn't understand that phrase. And then he's shocked that she would think he would lie. She's all, and do you like this Martha Dewberry? Is she your girlfriend? His brow puckered while his gaze lingered over Leah's face. She is Amish. And I'm not. She heard the unspoken message in his comment. It's like, Leah, you hated this guy two minutes ago. Yeah. Jesus. So they go to play a video game. Because uh, he says, play is not forbidden. And he turns out to be really good at it. They talk about how electricity isn't the only thing that would keep him from games like that. But also time. Because he says, work helps me understand that my life is but one small part of God's greater order. And she hits a nerve with him when she asks if he isn't curious about the outside world. And he admits that he is, but he's seen both good and bad while out, you know, like there at the hospital and stuff. She goes, well, it looks like we've come full circle, Ethan. You were right after all. The English and the Amish, Amish can't mingle. He stood too. But we can care about one another, he said carefully. We can always care. She knew he meant care in a brotherly way. But after spending time with him, she didn't want to be just another sister to him. She wanted to be a girl who mattered to him the way Martha Dewberry mattered. Except that Leah wasn't Amish, and she never would be. Unless she became Amish. Good Lord, Leah. I mean, are you thinking about marrying this guy already? You've seriously been talking to him for like half an hour. And she's like regretting her entire way of life. Just so she can fuck this guy, I guess? I don't know. I don't know. I mean, you were the 15-year-old girl. Were you thinking about like marrying everybody? So I wonder if that's the one. Did you do any of that? Uh, no. No. I don't think so. Did you? Probably. Yeah? <laughs> yeah, no one me, probably. Oh, man. So later that night, he tells Charity that he's going home to help with work, but that he would be back. The doctor tells Leah that he's going to take a biopsy of that knee that's hurting, and she freaks out because that's how they found out her grandmother had cancer. Let me get the whole backstory on that. She was her dad's mom. And Leah's mom wouldn't let them see each other after her dad left. But her grandmother always found ways. But when she developed cancer, Leah's mom let Leah visit her. But then her grandmother got a letter saying her son had died, found in an alley. And then she died shortly thereafter. So that's all real fun. Mm -hmm. So Leah pretty much, I guess, assumes all this horrible shit's going to happen from her biopsy. Uh, Rebecca seems to be getting better, though, and Charity insists it's a mix of the medicine and prayer. Again, at least they're not totally discounting the modern medicine, yeah. being at least a part of it. And that night, Leah sees that nurse by Rebecca's bed again, and the two of them are whispering together, and Rebecca later says that that's her friend, Gabriella. Ethan shows up with a great surprise. He and his dad have cut down a tree and brought it to replace the pediatric ward's Christmas tree that had apparently been stolen. Uh, this is a very big deal because the Amish don't do the whole tree decoration thing, apparently. And Leah gets very turned on watching Ethan <laughs> set the tree up. For some reason, their dad lets Ethan and Charity stay to attend this tree decorating party that night, which is just confusing as hell to all of the Long Acre kids, uh, and very loud. Leah and the girls go into the library, and Rebecca finds a book with angels in it, which is also confusing, because they shouldn't have wings. And Charity gives a whole lesson on real angels from the Bible. I hope you yeah. heard those quotation marks. For our purposes, most importantly notes that they can look just like people if they so choose. And, you know, Leah's like, well, why don't they always protect and rescue people? And Charity's just like, well, sending angels is God's will. Then they're all pretty confused by Santa Claus and presents. And the angel on the tree 
you know, with his wings and, you know, typical angel look kind of makes Leah feel guilty, like she can't look at it. Uh, but they get into the carol singing, all of them. And when Charity and Ethan leave, he promises to be there Monday when she wakes up from her biopsy. She can't sleep that night, and so she goes back into the rec room where Gabriella finds her. She tells her everything will be all right, telling her, God never puts more on a person than the person can bear, and stays with her until she falls asleep back in her room. And when she wakes up, Rebecca tells her that Gabriella told her she's going home tomorrow. No, that means she'll never see Ethan again. Oh, no. I mean, there were some times when Ethan was talking and I thought he was just about to say, woman, know your place. Yeah. So I don't understand where all of this affection is coming from, really. Because he's hot. (laughs) And he said she's the most beautiful girl he's ever seen. And that buggy talk. Mm -hmm. Mm Mm-hmm. Uh, Rebecca watches Leah put on her makeup and they have a really nice discussion, actually, about the differences in their culture. Like, Rebecca asks why she wears makeup and Leah says it's her custom, like wearing a bonnet is Rebecca's. And Leah learns how different weddings are for the Amish. Like, Rebecca has never heard of a honeymoon. And because apparently new couples will go around to other people's houses and stay and then go to their new home that seems very awkward have you ever heard of that uh seems like i have yeah Mm -hmm. it it was not surprising to me but it seems like i've heard that before Mm -hmm. (laughs) uh she gets hella bored later that day and molly takes her down to the real cafeteria where they have cake And she tells her all about her sister, Emily, who had died when she was 14 from leukemia. Cool story to tell another teen in a hospital, Molly. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. But Leah gets through her biopsy just fine. Probably because Gabriella was there to blow her a kiss beforehand. And then after she's back in her room for a while, Ethan arrives. But it's because Rebecca's being discharged. Boo. So Leah goes down to the library so she's not in the way of them getting Rebecca's stuff together. But Charity finds her and gives her a pillowcase she embroidered for her. And then it's Ethan's turn. Aw, yeah. Leah gets snarky and jealous about Martha Dewberry and that damn buggy again. And Ethan's all, there's only one girl I want in my buggy. Damn. And then they kiss. And surely that's not allowed. Yeah, I would think not. No, that would be. But who cares? Back at the room, Charity gives Leah their address and says, you know, if Leah wants to write to Ethan, just put in a letter addressed to her. So Charity's a true homie. Hmm. Uh, so they're gone and we have a sad time, but it's about to get worse. Hey, kids, do you love fighting over the card catalog? Totally. Now you can find your favorite podcast all over the world wide web. Look for us on Facebook, Instagram, Tumblr, YouTube, and Pinterest at Fighting Over the Card Catalog or on Twitter at Card Catalog Pod. And as a special bonus, head over to our very own website, fightingoverthecardcatalog.com. And now you can get the inside scoop on co-host Jess on Instagram and Twitter at Jess Digress. Whoa! Next, you can become a junior cataloger just by sharing us with your friends and rating and subscribing on Apple Podcasts. Whoa! Available wherever podcasts are sold. Podcasts not actually sold, but available in all podcatchers for free. Junior catalogers under the age of 18, ask your parent or guardian's permission before downloading. 
Surprise! Leah's got bone cancer. A tumor on her finger weakened that bone, causing it to break. And then she's got another one on her knee. Cool! So, she's going to have to get chemo, which, you know, brings her out quite a bit. Uh, but the best part of all this is that this 16-year-old girl is completely by herself while receiving this news. What the fuck? Well, you know. The doctor says he is... What? Grow up. Oh, my God. Cupcake. Wow. <laughs> The doctor said he, like, has a call into her mom, and he'll let Leah know as soon as she calls back. Does that mean he hadn't talked to her at all yet? Yeah, that's what it sounds like. And then just dropped all this on Leah? What is that? I mean, can you give a minor that sort of news without their parents' permission? I don't know. This was 96, you know. No rules. No rules, just right. I don't know. Uh, at least Molly's there to comfort her a little bit, but oh uh, god. That's just fucking I wouldn't want to give a sixteen year old girl news like that all by herself. Can you imagine that Yeah, I mean you just have to deal with a lot of crying all day. Yeah. Ugh. Anyway, her mom calls early the next morning and Leah goes into the doctor's office to talk to her. And her mom is pissed, y'all. This is preposterous, she was saying. My daughter checks into your hospital less than a week ago with a broken finger. You diddle around with all kinds of testing. And then you call and tell me she has bone cancer? I can't blame her for this. <laughs> uh, so that now they are going to come home right away. But as they are in Japan, it's going to be a while. Um, and until they get there, her mom tells the doctor to not start chemo. And he gets pretty pissy about that, saying they need to, you know, get started right away. But, like, it's two days, my dude. Let her mom be there to start chemo. Fuck. I'm so done with a lot of these people. Hmm. Um, so Leah and Molly get to talking about chemo, which Leah's obviously not thrilled about. Um, and then Molly asked her about Gabriella, saying, like, there's no one on the staff with that name. Ooh. And... It must be a ghost. It must be a ghost. Or an angel. She makes Leah promise to hit her call button if Gabriella uh, comes into her room again. After, you know, like, creeping her out, you know, like, about security issues and talking about how, like, one time... You know, somebody pretending to be staff and then was, like, hanging around the nursery and shit. And that was creepy. But, yeah, security. Good. Um, so, Leah's mom arrives with a whole bunch of commotion. But Leah's happy to see her. Um, and even her new stepfather, Neil. <sighs> but the next day, when they meet with the doctor... He lays it all out, including how, in his opinion, they need to amputate her leg and finger where the tumors are before moving on to chemo. Like, I'm sorry, what? I guess we should be grateful that he waited till her mom was there to drop that one um, on Leah. But ugh. I had completely forgotten that whole thing. Yeah. And like I literally did, you know, the blinking guy gif reaction. Uh -huh. Yeah, that's what I did. <laughs> so, I mean, like, if it wasn't for the miracle, that might have been what saved her life. But, you know, this book is all about miracles. I know. So Yeah. So he's saying all this with an inconclusive pathology report. And so her mom is rightly like so it's just your opinion? And he's all, well, I'm an expert. My opinion means a lot. Like, okay, my dude. You're going to cut off a young girl's leg because of your opinion? I'd absolutely want a second opinion, too. So, yeah, at this point, my opinion on Leah's mom has just completely flipped. <laughs> she is there fighting for her daughter, and I am here for it. She's going to have them run the bone scan again and then get Leah discharged for Christmas. And another biopsy after that, if they think it's necessary. So, 
Leah feels a bit better there with her mom behind her fighting for her. And so sends him off to the hotel to get some sleep. And then surprise, Ethan arrives. She tells him everything that's happened and then then basically starts just like yelling at him about God. Yeah. <laughs> you know, why would God let this happen to me, et cetera, et cetera. And he's all, I have questions for God too. Like, I do not understand why when there are so many Amish girls, I have to care so much in my heart for an English one. And yeah. then they totally start making out. <laughs> so you heard why he was there to begin with. Yes, because he had a dream that she needed him. Like, okay, he snuck away from his whole community because of this dream he had. He's going to be in a shit ton of trouble, but he's like, eh, he's not going to leave until she leaves the hospital. So, <sighs> like, seriously, you people have talked for like maybe an hour completely. All together. But they're hot, so it's fine. Uh, that night, she wakes up and Ethan's not in the room, but Gabriella is. Leah's like, girl, you better get out of here. People are mad you're sneaking around being a creeper. But Gabriella asks Leah to do her a favor. Tell Molly there's a book in the library for her. It will mean a lot to her. Like, what? Huh. And Leah's all, how do I know that's a good thing? I mean, you lied, you know, making me think you're a nurse. And Gabrielle is like, well, I never said I was. I can't help what you thought. Like, ooh, okay. And then she says she has something for Leah. And takes her hands. Do you want to be well? Of course. Then believe. Believe what? Believe in the power and goodness of God. I, I believe. Leah stared into Gabriella's eyes and suddenly she did believe. She believed in a power higher and stronger than what could be seen or explained. She closed her eyes and a feeling of peace enveloped her. When she opened her eyes, she was alone, still clutching her knee. All she saw was darkened corners of her room and the lamp glowing on the table. Nothing remained of Gabriella. Uh... <sighs> Were you enjoying the book at this point? No. <laughs> I was just waiting for it to get over with. Uh-huh, uh-huh. So the next day she and Ethan go to the library and... Something leads her to a certain shelf, and something leads her to a diary, and something tells her this is the book. Okay, Lurleen. God. So she has her CT scan, and then she has to do it a second time, because the doctor didn't see what he was expecting, and the tech is, like, highly offended, like, I know how to do my job. Then it's time for her to leave, but first she gives a diary to Molly, and oh my god, it's her dead sister, Emily's diary. She wrote in it all the time, but then it disappeared, but Molly still has the key. What a wonderful Christmas gift for her whole family. Oh my god. It was very convenient writing. Mm-hmm. Uh, then it's time to say deuces to Molly and Ethan. Leah writes Charity a letter about a month later to fill her in. So they went to see the CT results and her tumors had shrunk. She had another biopsy and though there were still some questionable cells, no amputation. Still chemo though, but whatever. She's keeping her leg and her finger. And the doctor says there have been cases of spontaneous remission before. And Neil says... Spontaneous remissions in my day, we called them miracles. Uh... <sighs> then Leah says she got a Bible for Christmas and she's been reading a lot about angels. And guess what? She thinks Gabriella may have been one. What? I had no idea that's where this was going. 
Then she says, anyway, I do know that you and Rebecca and Ethan are angels too. Earth angels who came into my life when I needed a miracle. Thanks for your friendship. So the word miracle is thrown around way too much and it huh. bugs the shit out of me. Like, not just in this book, but like in general. Right. I hate when people say... So, a lot of times, a miracle is something that someone themselves cannot explain. Right. That happened, and they have no explanation for how it happened. It doesn't mean that there is no explanation. It means that they themselves cannot explain it. Mm -hmm. What really bothers me is that how people say babies are a miracle. It's like, no, they're mm. not. They literally happen all the time, and we know how they happen. It's a very definition of not being a miracle. Huh. I'm sorry. Anyway, so that's the book. So do you do you yourself believe in the power of prayer? No. I well, I mean, I believe in positive thinking probably has something to do with things. So I guess maybe a placebo effect mainly. Right. Right. So I do believe in the power of prayer specifically for that reason. Okay. That when you have positive thoughts, um, that it can literally have a healing effect on your body. There's also been a uh, medical case in which a woman was told that she had um, cancer in a certain amount of time to live. Mm -hmm. And um, she started worrying so much about what was going to happen to her kids and her family um, her health started degenerating mm -hmm. and about a month later, um, the doctors told her that she was, that they gave the wrong diagnosis to her, that it was somebody else's diagnosis. It wasn't even her, hers, but she was so far gone in her health just from the negative mm -hmm. thoughts that mm -hmm. she ended up dying. She literally died of worry. Wow. Um, so there, you know, there are medical cases of people having positive and negative mm -hmm. thoughts and it actually affecting people. Mm -hmm. And, you know, words themselves are, are like magic. You know, that's why they call it spelling. It's a spell. Mm -hmm. uh, and it can have a literal effect on, on people. You know, you, you call somebody a bad name. It, it changes their physiology inside. Mm -hmm. and, uh, you give somebody a compliment. It can, raise their spirits and make them feel better. Um, sure. Yeah. So anyway, there, there is something to be yeah, said about that. It can, that. but it's not yeah. anything you should depend upon. Right. Like you can have the best attitude about it, but still fucking die. But then it's just God's will. And he's testing the people in your life or something. Anyway, did you have a favorite bit at all? Um, the part where she got cancer. Yeah. No. Cool. No, no, no favorite parts. Okay. Well, this series was like my first like real introduction to the Amish. Like I had like a general idea about them. Um, later on in the series, we learned, you know, more than just like what's kind of spoken about here. So I just thought that was interesting as like a 14 year old who didn't know much about them. Um, but yeah, least favorite, uh, obviously most of it. <laughs> um, I mean like in her other death and sickness books, like Lurleen is so straightforward with the realism of like the medical procedures and illnesses and stuff. But like, with this one, it's like, let's just throw all that out and go with angels and miracles. And it's like, it's it's just a weird fucking switch. It's like, what happened? So, yeah. Right. Yeah. You know, uh, you know, Anne Rice. Yeah. Um, there was a, you know, she did a lot of um, cult. Um, I don't know what you call it anyway. She did a lot of vampire stuff. Yeah, and, vampires. And monster books and yeah. stuff. Well, when her husband got sick, um, she kind of did a flip where she stopped writing completely about anything like that and went full-blown religious. Uh -huh. And 
her her writing from that point on was completely different. Um, now in the recent couple of years, she's kind of started back doing some vampire stuff. But mm-hmm. yeah, yeah. Well, Lurleen, Lurleen started writing all these books because her son uh, had juvenile diabetes. And so that's why she was writing all of the, you know, more realistic books to begin with. Like the sad thing, it happened. Sad, you know. But yeah, so I don't know what happened at this point. But it's bad. It's bad, Lurleen. <laughs> And it's like, are you telling kids with cancer that they can expect, like, an angel to save them? What the fuck, Lurleen? Yep. <sighs> no Snark Zone? Welcome to the No Snark Zone. I mean, I think we kind of had it at the beginning, but... That's not what I was going to talk about. Okay. Happy anniversary. Oh, happy anniversary. That I totally forgot about <laughs> until you said it today. It's not our wedding anniversary, but we've been together four years now. Uh, and then two years ago, you proposed to me on uh, today, March 18th. So, yeah. Yay. <laughs> that doesn't need any snark. So, yeah, that's all I got for that. Yay, yes. There's no one I'd rather spend a pandemic with. Uh. <laughs> so what you reading? So I don't know how much I talked about um, the the girl in red. Mm-hmm. I think you had just started reading it. Yeah. So um, it's... It's quite apropos because it's basically it's supposed to be like a modern day retelling of of Red Riding Hood and the author let me see if I can get her name here uh Christina Henry I guess she starts thinking about well why would this girl be in the woods by herself and why would she not be taking roads to get to her grandmother's house etc cetera, etc cetera. So she has I'm placed... trying real hard not seeing into the woods. Yeah. You know this. <laughs> so she's she's placed this story in the middle of a pandemic <laughs> in which um people are going crazy and um they they uh, people are kind of becoming zombies. Uh-huh. In a way some of them and then the people who um uh are surviving are like becoming bad people and going around and killing other people and taking all the resources. And mm. so she sticks to the woods to stay off the main roads. Um, also, when the government finds people, they take them to a, you know, a, one of their centers um, to try to group everybody together. And she, mm-hmm. she and her whole family were, um, were obviously afraid of that Mm -hmm. um but her mom and dad end up her mom gets this virus but before she dies from it these races come because Mm her mom is black and her dad is white and oh no and her parents like distract them while uh while her and her brother run away and then something happens later. Anyway, it was really, it, I thought it was pretty good. It was pretty good telling. Yeah. Um, and quite apropos to yeah. what's happening today. Super fun. Um, so I read that and then I'm almost finished with, with Star Wars Old Republic Fatal Alliance. Okay, so I've been in there with you. While you're working and listening to this book, mm-hmm. Star Wars audiobooks are buck wild. <laughs> oh my God. There's so many sound effects and heavy breathing for uh-huh. a very long time. I was like, what the fuck is happening? Well, it's like Jeez. this one, you know, once you listen to audiobooks, there are a lot of different styles. Like sometimes yeah. they have a full cast. Mm-hmm. Where every individual is played by a different voice, That's different gotta person. That's got to be so expensive. And then they have also sound effects and things mm-hmm. like that. Um, this one is one of the intermediates. Every voice is done by one person. Yeah. So he's got to make up different voices right. for everybody. But then there's also sound effects right. that are that are 
mixed in with it, lightsaber fights and blasters. Like a and, lot. There's like almost yeah. always something going on in the yeah. background. Sometimes it's a little annoying because sometimes they'll just be in space and you'll ha- the, there'll be this annoying noise that you just hear. Yeah, there was something yesterday that. Yeah, I didn't even know what it was. Very annoying. Yeah, yeah. Are all Star Wars audiobooks like that? Um, all from this series has been read by the same person. So oh. yeah. Wow. I don't think I could concentrate <laughs> with all that. <laughs> Uh, right. So, anything else this week? Um, not yet. Well, I just mean in general. No? You haven't read anything else? Oh, no, I no. haven't. Stay the fuck home, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> oh, next week, we are reading Theater Shoes by Noelle Streetfeld. Field. Anyway. Field Felding. Yeah. yeah. Anyways, there's an audio book, so. But it's a good book. So I'm excited. Uh, thanks so much for listening, everybody. We're rereading the book through your childhood. So you don't have to. Bye, everybody. Deuces.